better in the marketplace so that we can glorify your name. We thank you for your creation and thank you for the talent and the gift that you have given to us. We pray that you will use the speaker today to help us to reveal the talent and gift that you have given to every one of us. We thank you in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, continue eating, okay? <laughs> Sorry, uh, my name is Stephanie, just in case you guys don't know me. Okay. Uh, I'm the uh, Eklao Tong Gong. Tong Gong, you so A co worker, thank you. <laughs> Helper, okay. So today is my biggest uh, privilege to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Justin Strong. Okay. So, um, that's a very good cartoon. Does it look at him? <laughs> okay, so I know Justin in the Western Digital uh, Toastmaster two years ago. Yeah, so it's a public speaking club. I don't know, have you guys, uh, anybody know Toastmaster Club? Can show him? Okay, so that, that's great. So I joined that because I need a public speaking skill, and I was so lucky I get a great coach, Justin. Yeah, he was, he was there, so he gave me the very good coach, and he's my mentor. And yeah, um, as you guys know, we, especially me, Chinese, <laughs> uh, not very good in uh, public speaking, especially me, okay? I think that's because of education. You know, when I, I remember I was little, every time I tried to speak up, and then I got punished. My teacher, <laughs> the, shut up, don't, 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 don't speak up, you know? And sometimes I got reprimanded. So I think when I grow up, I realized I cannot do public speaking. I was, Every time I do public speaking, I feel like, uh, I don't know, my, my heart kind of bursts out of chest. I can hear my heart beat, you know. Not today, okay? <laughs> Thanks to Justin. I mean, um, I already got a great coach from him. I listened to his uh, uh, training, and he's really good. So he also speaks Chinese, okay? Wow. And uh, he only coached Western Digital employee. He coached like a whole entire company, right? And, you know, we're so lucky to him here. He can give us a free coach, okay? After that, no guarantee. He's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so uh, I think without any further ado, let's bring up the uh, speaker. Trust him. Thank you so much. six years ago. A businessman is on a business trip and at night he goes down to the bar in his hotel. He sees an attractive woman at the bar and he goes up to her and offers to buy her a drink. The next thing he knows, he wakes up, he's groggy, he's in pain, and he doesn't know what's happened to him. He looks around and he realizes that he's in a bathtub full of ice. And he looks to his side and he sees a piece of paper. He picks up the piece of paper and he reads it. It said, call 911 immediately. He looks, there's a cell phone there. He picks up the cell phone and he dials 911. He explains the situation to the 911 operator. The 911 operator tells him, sir, could you reach behind your back? He reaches behind his back and she said, do you feel anything? Yes, he said, I feel a tube coming up there. The 
911 operator calmly tells him, I'm sorry, sir, to inform you, but there's been a group of thieves who's been harvesting people's organs, and your kidney has been removed. But don't worry, the, the paramedics are on their way immediately. Now, this story circulated for years and years, and it was very popular, actually, on college campuses. And I guarantee if you hear that story, you would probably think twice about going up to a woman and buying her a drink. <laughs> But the story is totally untrue. It's never happened. Nobody has ever woken up in a bath of ice with their kidney removed. And yet the story was popular and it persisted and many, many people believed it. Now why did this story gain so much traction in the world? People in the United States, in Taiwan, in Singapore, all over the world had heard it, especially on college campuses. Why would a story like this get so much traction, and yet many companies who have a budget, who have organized marketing campaigns, who have all sorts of uh, resources behind it, can't seem to get traction in the marketplace? And yet this story, with nobody behind it, no marketing budget, nobody, nothing organized, and yet it went viral, and so many people heard it and believed it. And that is one of the power of stories. And so I want to talk to you today about how you use stories and data to make powerful and persuasive presentations. How many people here have heard of Warren Buffett? Okay. Warren Buffett arguably is one of the most successful investors on the earth today. And he said, if you want to increase your value, you can increase it by 50% by learning public speaking skills. Warren Buffett has one certificate on his office wall. It's not his MBA, it's not his business degree. The certificate is a public speaking class that he attended at the beginning of his career. It's estimated that 30 million presentations are given every single day in business. That's 20,000 per second. And they're supposed to persuade people to do something. Unfortunately, many presentations, all they do is persuade the listeners that they had wished they'd never been to that presentation <laughs> at all. So what makes content persuasive? How do you actually persuade people to do something? Because there's three things that you want to do in a presentation. There's three goals in every presentation. The first one is what do you want your audience to know? The second one should be what do you want your audience to feel? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Emotion actually is a very important part of a presentation. And the third one is what do you want your audience to do? What action do you want them to take as a result of your presentation? It's no point in presenting good information and yet not have your audience actually take action. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher and teacher, and he proposed that there are three things that make a persuasive presentation, or three things that you need to do to persuade somebody of something. And the three components are ethos, pathos, and logos, or credibility, emotion, and logic. And he said, you need those three things to convince somebody of something. Now, that was 2,000 years ago, but have people changed in 2,000 years? No. Culture has changed, technology has changed, but people fundamentally have not changed. And he believed the most important part of, uh, of persuasiveness was emotion. Now, I was trained as a data scientist or a computer scientist. I have my degree in computer science. I spent the first five years of my career as a software developer and architect. And I always believed that if you had just good enough logic and persuasive argument, you could persuade anybody of anything. And now I don't believe that anymore. I believe you need these three components of an argument to persuade people.
because a lot of what we do and the decisions that we make are actually based on emotion and not logic. Data leads us to conclusions, but emotion leads us to action. This is a very important point. Data leads us to conclusions, but emotion leads us to actions. And there was actually a study done on this. Done on this. Anthony DeMas Antonio, excuse me, Antonio Damasio is a social scientist who studied people's brains whose emotional component of their brain was destroyed. These people could not feel any emotion at all. Now what you would think was these people would make totally logical decisions. How many people like Star Trek? So Spock, right? No emotion, makes his, all his decisions totally based on logic, right? Well, what the social scientist found out, Antonio Damasio, for those people whose emotional component of their brain was destroyed, they could not make any decisions at all. They couldn't decide what to wear in the morning. They couldn't decide what to eat for breakfast. They couldn't decide where to go that day. And he studied them and he asked those people, why not? And they said they knew intellectually what they should do. They just could not bring themselves to do it. So if you have no emotions, you actually cannot make decisions. Now, as I mentioned, logic leads us to conclusions, but emotion leads us to action. So in your presentations, it's very important to have an emotional component to your argument. Now that doesn't mean you want to make your audience cry or be scared or jump up and down, but maybe you want them to feel curious. Maybe you want them to feel anger. Maybe you want them to feel some other emotion, but you need them to feel something in order for them to take action. How does storytelling play into this? We, as humans, are wired for storytelling. When we used to gather around the campfire, we used to tell stories. Before we had printing, before we had computers, we used to tell stories, and stories were the way that we transmitted information that was vital for our survival. When you gathered around the campfire at night, somebody would tell a story about how they survived during a drought, how they found water, or how they defended themselves against a saber-toothed tiger, or how they killed a woolly mammoth. And these stories were required to, to, for people to survive, and that's the information that was trans that's how information was transmitted. And of course, in the Old Testament, information was transmitted through stories quite a bit through Jewish tradition. And so stories are a way that we use to transmit information, and they were vital for our survival. <clears throat> Richard Branson, how many people know who he is? Richard Branson, again, is a very successful entrepreneur. He's CEO of the Virgin Group of Companies, Virgin Airlines, Virgin Mobile, and several other companies. I think music, if that's still around. Richard said that there is nothing more effective and affecting than storytelling. Every year, Richard Branson takes all of his top executives to his private island, Necker Island, and every night, all of the executives gather together around a virtual campfire and they tell stories. They tell stories of their successes, they tell stories about their failures in the company. But he has a storytelling session with all of the executives. Barbara Corcoran, she's a Shark Tank fame. She said, show me an MBA and numbers and that's nice, but tell me a story and we'll talk. Entrepreneurs need to be able to communicate stories in order to be successful. To tell the story of your company, to investors, to the public, and also transmit and build a company culture. There is nothing more effective in building a company culture than telling your company examples through stories of how you expect them to act. 
your brain on stories. When you hear a story, your brain acts very differently than when you're given just raw facts. And there's three different chemicals that a good story will generate in your brain. And these are really important for a speaker to have. The first one is oxytocin, or the trust chemical. Oxytocin is generated when you trust somebody. It's kind of, sometimes it's called the love chemical. This is chemical is generated between a mother and her child during the early months of, uh, when it, after a baby is born. And so there's elevated levels of oxytocin in the mother and elevated levels of oxytocin in the baby. And that develops that bonding between a mother and a baby. There's also dopamine. Dopamine is called the pleasure chemical. When you hear a good story, dopamine levels elevate in your brain also. And then cortisol. Cortisol is the attention chemical. Cortisol is your brain telling you, pay attention to this, this is important. When you hear a good story, you generate all three of these chemicals, and as a presenter, this is a good thing. Because this makes people trust you, they feel good when they hear your presentation, and they pay attention to you. Here are a few things that I want to talk about on stories, and specifically stories and data. First, identifying your story. Sometimes it's difficult, especially if maybe we're an accountant or maybe we're an engineer, and say, oh, I don't have a story, I just have data. There's always a story, and I'll give you some examples of how to bring that out. Don't make your audience work too hard when you present your information and data. I'll present a few techniques to make it easier for your audience to understand your data. And then something I call maximizing our signal to noise ratio. When you transmit data over a medium, there's the signal and that's the data that you want to get across the medium. And there's the noise that's generated that's not part of your signal, but sometimes happens in because there's no perfect transmission medium. And in any transmission, you want to maximize your signal or the data that you actually want to get across and minimize your noise. So there's ways that you can do that in a presentation. Let's dive in. So what makes a great story? There's lots of stories around, but what actually makes a really good story? Well, there's three components to a really good story. First of all, you want to have a hero. You want to have a hero in a story. And it's best if that hero is an underdog. Now, an underdog is somebody who should not succeed. Or maybe it's it, nobody believes that they will succeed. And when they do, it makes a really good story. So a hero is great, and it's even better if the hero is an underdog. The next one, there's some type of struggle involved. They have to struggle against something. They have to overcome. They have to compete. And then the last one is a villain somebody or something that's opposing whatever it is that they're trying to do. And the villain doesn't have to be a person. It can be a bureaucratic process. It can be something that's maybe ineffective, or it could be um, high, rate, high defect rates, or whatever it is. But a, a, it's great in the story to have a hero, a struggle, and a villain. Rocky, how many of you have watched the movie Rocky? Now, Rocky was a great movie, but the actual story of Sylvester Stallone is, I feel, more interesting. Sylvester Stallone started as an actor in New York City. He didn't do very well. He made one movie, it was called The Lords of Flatbush. I bet nobody has, has seen it. It was a terrible movie. He wasn't doing very well, but he really believed that he needed to be an actor. So he moved his wife and his dog to Hollywood. Then he tried to talk to as many people as he could to see if he could get a job as an actor in Hollywood. Nobody wanted to hire him. You know what they told him? They told him, you shouldn't be an actor because you're too ugly. <laughs> and you shouldn't be an actor because you've got that lisp. You don't talk very well. 
you're not a leading man, why don't you go and do something else? But he really believed in himself. He really believed that he should be an actor. One day, he actually sat in somebody's office at 4 p.m. trying to get an interview. They left, he slept there overnight, and waited till the person came back in the morning. That's how hard he really wanted to be an actor. He started running out of money though. Nobody wanted to give him a job. Eventually, his wife left him and said, look, I'm, I've had enough of this, I'm done. And, all, and he ran out of money, all he had was his dog. And in fact, he didn't have any money to feed his dog, so he thought, I need to sell my dog. It's the only thing I have left, but in order to keep the dog well, I don't have money to feed him, I'm gonna sell him. He went to a liquor store in the neighborhood, waited for somebody to come by, offered to sell his dog, after a while, somebody offered to buy his dog for $30. As you can imagine, he was very depressed after that. Went into a bar, just sat there, and up on the TV screen in the bar was a world heavyweight boxing match. So he just sat there and he would watch it. And in this boxing match, there was an underdog, like I mentioned, and the champion. Underdog went many, many rounds with the champion and eventually won. Sylvester got inspired by that and he said, that's a metaphor for life. That's a metaphor for my life. And in the next three days, he wrote the script for Rock. Now he had a challenge, he had to sell it to somebody and convince somebody to make a movie out of it. So he went to all sorts of different movie studios and he finally convinced one to buy it and they were offering a couple hundred thousand dollars for the script. He thought that was great, but he had one stipulation. He had to be Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, no, no way. We're gonna get one of the leading actors in Hollywood to be Rocky. You can't be Rocky for the reasons everybody else told him. And he said, no, no deal. I gotta be Rocky, otherwise I'm not gonna sell the script. He was very convinced and confident that this is his destiny to play Rocky. Finally, the studio said, okay, but we're only gonna give you 30,000. He said, okay, that's fine. And when he got his $30,000, the first thing he went to was back to that liquor store, waited for that guy who bought his dog, and negotiated for his dog, and he actually paid about $1,000 for his dog. But he thought it was worth it because he really loved his dog. Well, the rest is history. Rocky won Best Picture of the Year that year. And that's what got Sylvester Stallone started in his acting career. So this is a story that no matter how many statistics I quote today, what will you remember a week, a month from now? You will remember the story of Sylvester Stallone. And that's the power of stories, especially a story that has an underdog and some type of a struggle and success. So one of the things that you can do in a presentation is that, so one key point in a presentation that to, for you to remember is give your presentation some type of structure. People will remember structured information more than they will if you're completely random and you start quoting you know, things almost randomly. But one thing you can do also with a story is have a structure for your story. So one type structure, as I mentioned before, is the hero, villain, and then solution. So villain, paint a picture of what is. So maybe there is, a, as I mentioned, a bureaucratic process that is slowing us down in our business. And then paint a picture of what could be. What if we didn't have this process in place and we didn't have to submit our reports manually. What if we could submit our reports automatically? And so you paint a picture of what could be, that gets your audience excited, and then you introduce your solution to close the gap between the what is and what could be. Steve Jobs did this in the first introduction of the iPhone. So what were the villains? The villains were current cell phones the so-called smartphones of the day. They were, actually weren't very smart. They were difficult to use. They had lots of space for a physical keyboard 
They had all sorts of issues. And then he said, what if you had a large screen and you had no fixed keyboard and no stylus to deal with? And it worked like magic. So he said what it was that could be. So he introduced his vision. And then the hero is the new iPhone. So the introduction of the first iPhone, a lot of people say, was one of the most successful presentations in business. So as I mentioned, we are, today we are swimming in data. In fact, Western Digital, one of our taglines is that we make data thrive, or we create environments for data to thrive. Western Digital products store more than half of the world's data. So data is not our issue today. We have more data than anything. Almost anything you want to learn, what can you do? Go to Google, you learn how to raise a turtle. You go to Google, you can learn how to speak another language. Almost any information that we have today is available to us. So data is not our problem today, usually. So you have data, and the cat is yawning in this picture, so what? I don't care. What story does your data tell? That's what you want to get across to your audience. What story does it tell? So you could say, if you were a newspaper writer, what headline would your story tell? Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a reporter for a school newspaper. And you're a student, you're a student reporter for a school newspaper. And the principal comes to you and said, next Thursday, all of the faculty in the school, all the teachers and the principal, will, going, will be going to Sacramento for a colloquium for training on new training methods, or new teaching methods. And there will be these three people here, an anthropologist, a, um, a California governor, a college president. So now it's your job, of course, to write a headline for the story. What is your headline for the story? Any suggestions? Anybody can guess what your headline would be? California governor to train school faculty. OK, that's one, one, one possible headline. Anybody else have a? Another suggestion? New uh, teaching method. Okay. Anybody else have a suggestion? Remember, you're a student reporter for the school student newspaper. I would suggest. I would suggest the headline for the article is "No School on Thursday." <laughs> <laughs> the students don't care. The teachers don't care who's teaching them or what they're doing. All they care about is that they get a day off. So remember, remember your audience and what it matters to them. And then when you have your data, think about your audience and what headline would your audience care about. Another way to communicate information and one, uh, to think about it is take your audience on your data journey. So tell your data in a story-like format. So here's an example. Infant mortality rates. So I'm starting off this data journey by telling my audience and generating some curiosity and asking a question. So here are infant mortality rates starting in 1990 and going all the way to 2016. And these are for developed countries in the world. And it might be a little bit difficult to see some of these here, but the red one is the United States, and all of the other ones are the developed countries in the world. And over time, you can see that the U.S. infant mortality rate is the highest in the world. Why is that? We're a developed country. We pride ourselves in having one of the best medical systems in the world. A lot of people would say the U.S. medical system is the best in the world, but yet we have the highest infant mortality rates out of all the developed countries. Why is that? Well, it's certainly not because we don't spend enough money. The United States is the top bar here. We spend more per capita, more per person on health care than any other nation on Earth. And we still have the highest infant mortality rates among developed countries. 
the average is this red bar here, and these are how much the other countries spend on health care. So why do we have such a high infant mortality rate? Well, I did some digging on this. I saw the statistic, and I thought, that is odd. That, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. But then let's look at the data a little bit more. Maybe it's the way that we measure infant mortality. So there's two countries in the world, developed countries, that measure infant mortality the way that we do. And that is, or, or they bring out the details of the infant mortality. A lot of countries just say, here's the infant mortality rate. They don't say why. So if you remove babies that are born uh, before 22 weeks, that are born with less, that are underweight, and that are single baby births, so you exclude like uh, twins and triplets, the U.S. infant mortality rate goes down a little bit, but still almost twice as much as those as Austria and uh, Finland. So it's not the way that we measure it. What else could it be? Well, one of the things I looked at was, let's look at the infant mortality rate by state. And maybe that will give us a clue. So if you look at the red here, the red represents higher. The white represents lower. <coughs> Any guesses on, on a <coughs> correlation for infant mortality rates? What do the red states generally have in common here? Source. Poorer, yes. So there's a general correlation. So that, if you look at it by state, that's kind of like a, you might guess that. That doesn't prove anything, but it may lead you to do more research. So if you get more granular data, so if you look at the information by county, so what I have done here is that I've sorted the infant mortality rate by going from lowest rates to the highest rates by county, and then looked at income. So the higher the income in general, it's not a perfect correlation, the lower the mortality rate. And as income goes down, the mortality rate goes up. So again, it doesn't prove, but it gives us a clue where to look. Hmm, that seems like for the people who are have lower income, infant mortality rates go up. But again, okay, is that true? And if so, why? So here's another thing to look at. This looks at infant mortality Right, uh, one day, one week, one month, six months, and one year after a baby is born. So infant mortality isn't just right when a baby is born, but they also measure it over time. And what they, what this shows is that after the one, so to begin with, we're about the same as other countries. So after a baby is born, our hospital care is great. Infant mortality rate is very similar to other countries. But then it starts to go up after one month, and then after one year, that's when it gets really high. So our healthcare system actually is okay, it's fine, it's working. We're similar to other countries, but babies are dying within the first year higher at higher rates than other other countries. So what uh, so actually after doing some of this research, um, researchers looked into this and actually what's happening in the first year. The biggest cause of death among infants in the first year is called SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And that had to do with how babies are lying when they're sleeping. So educating poor people on how to put their babies to sleep and whether to lay them down on their stomach or on their side or on their back would help people to help to reduce the infant mortality rate. Now, What's important here in this presentation is not infant mortality rates. I'm not here to teach you about that. But the point is, what I did is I took you on a data journey. I started off with a question, and I thought it was an interesting question that made, uh, made me think when I first found it, and hopefully made you, you think also, yeah, why is our infant mortality rate so high? If you can generate audience curiosity and then take them through a journey on the answer, you'll grab their attention for your whole presentation. One person who was a science educator said that he 
so you saw a book on why does Saturn have why does Saturn have rings and what are the rings composed of? You said you read a 20-page article just to find out at the end of the article that rings are made of dust. <laughs> but that question caught his attention. So if you can generate curiosity, which is another emotion, you'll grab your audience's attention. So if you can take your audience on a data journey and take them through how a question can be answered, you'll get their attention. The other one is don't make your audience work too hard. You're competing in your presentation with what? Cell phone. Everybody has the world's knowledge and they have stupid things like this. So this person, she's holding a Hershey bottle of chocolate and she's saying, I love to go to the gym. I fill this with water, but I like to see people's looks when I have this chocolate that it looks like I'm drinking. It looks like people are judging me. Now, people have things like this on their phone all over. They have Facebook, they have Instagram, they have Reddit, they have all sorts of things that if you're not an interesting presenter or you make it too difficult for your audience, they're going to go to their phone. So what are a few ways to make it easier for your audience when you present your data? So first of all, when you have your visuals or your slides, there's something that I like to use, and that's what I call the billboard test. So a billboard, when you put up a billboard, you have maybe one, two seconds if somebody is distracted, to read it. You have almost no time. You have to get your message across virtually instantly. So if you look at this billboard, what is this billboard for? McDonald's. They don't even have to put McDonald's on here. They don't even have to put the whole logo. All they have to put is a piece of the logo that pretty well everybody recognizes. And on your left, you don't need to say any more. If you want to go to McDonald's, take the next left. So when you have your data and your information, think about a billboard. And think about, will my audience get the message in one or two seconds? If not, try and simplify it. Let me give you a couple examples. Hey, this is an example of a graph where somebody's trying to communicate that Connecticut has an aging population. The, the population of people 65 and older is increasing over time. But this data, this graph makes it a little bit <coughs> difficult to really see it. It takes you a little while to try and figure it out, right? There's actually all sorts of things wrong with this graph. Right, that I would fix. That, I, this is not mine, this is what I got off the uh, uh, website on the internet. Now, what they did to fix it, I think they actually made it worse. <laughs> they put it into pie graphs, pie charts, and they suggested this is better, but when I look at it, it even makes it more difficult to see that the population is aging. So one of the things you can do just put it in a line chart. This is a very simple solution, but you see immediately that the line at the bottom, age 65 and above, is rising. The age 0 to 19 is coming down, and in fact, if the trend continues, the age 65 and above will, uh, will get be higher as a percentage of the population than the age 0 to 19, and that's what's in the headline. So I have a headline at top, but in the graph, you can see it pretty much immediately. But that's the case. When you have data, make sure it's simple and it's easy for your audience to consume and to understand. Use the billboard test. If your audience takes more than a few seconds to understand it, it could be that your data is very complicated, and, and but most of the time, you can simplify it. Most of the information that we provide really can be simplified when we overcomplicate it. When we try to give our audience too much, what we really need to do is decide what's our headline and then simply provide our data to show that headline. The other one is always visualize your data. What do you see here? A tiger. Now, you saw the tiger immediately. We as people are very good 
because we had to avoid tigers <laughs> to survive. So our brains got really good at visualizing. Now a computer, to get a computer to recognize a tiger like that, where it looks so much like <coughs> grass, is extremely difficult. So computers are not great at doing that. We're really good at, at doing recognizing and visualizing. So we look at the table like this. Your brain has to work a lot to visualize this, but the other thing is that you'll be tempted. So this is four data sets. Now I have done some summarization here. I've done a sum, an average, and a standard deviation. Now, for all intents and purposes, the sum, the average, and the standard deviation of all of this data is exactly the same. So we might tend to believe that the data is very similar. But when we visualize it, it's, it, it's completely different. Even though the, so when you have an opportunity to present data at a table or, uh, or a graphical format, always present it in a graphical format if you can. Because we're very good at visualizing. We are not that great at looking at data in, in tables. When our caveman ancestors uh, had to hunt for food, they didn't write it down in the, in the table. No, they, they, they were visualizers, right? And that's what we're, our brain is good at because of survival. The other things that we want to do when we present our data is maximizing, as I mentioned, maximizing our signal to noise ratio. Now that is maximizing our data and not everything else. I'm going to go over a couple of techniques to do that. So the first of all, minimize our use of colors. Gray is your friend. So what do I mean by that? So let's go back to our infant mortality rate. So on here, here's the infant mortality rate of all of the countries, the developed countries. Now I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody present a graph, and they've got all of these colors on here, but they're like spaghetti. <laughs> you, okay, so Ireland, okay, well, first of all, you start to run out of colors, and then you try to go down the bottom and say, okay, where's Ireland? Well, this one looks blue, but that one looks, and you're trying to figure it out, and it just doesn't, it's very difficult, right? So one of the things you can do is say, first of all, what's my headline? What do I want to try and say to my audience? States. Now these countries matter only as a group. As individuals, I don't, I don't care to my audience whether this is Switzerland or this is Finland or, or which country is which, but as a group, what I want to show where that group is, and I want to highlight in red that the United States is the highest one. So what I do is I put all of these in gray because they don't matter, and then I put the one that I care about in red. Right, so I've got a list of all the countries here so people know what countries are being represented and generally what they are, and then the red one is the one I want to highlight. So in a graph, it's fine to put a lot of information on it, but really decide which is most important and highlight that one. The other one is to reduce what I call chart junk. Edward Tufte is a, is a data scientist who specializes in data visualization. He teaches classes, he's written several books, and he kind of coined this term chart junk. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go through an example. Here's a chart, and actually this is chart is actually, well, it looks okay. It looks at, again, infant mortality rate by country for one year, for 2017. Now, there's information on this chart that is meaningful, but there's information on the chart that doesn't help me to convey any, any of my information at all or any of my data. So one of the things is the background. So there's that blue background. The blue doesn't mean anything. I can take out the blue background and it, my data is still there. You can still see all the information. Sometimes people, when they create charts, they create, they add features because they look cool but it really doesn't add to your data. In fact, it makes it more difficult to see the data that you want to highlight. 
So if I, if I remove the blue there, my data is still there. So the general thing is, if I remove this, will it make it? Will my data remain, and will it make it easier for my audience to see it? If yes, remove it. So what else could we remove? Well, the lines there. Now the lines, it might be a little bit, some people might think, well, you need the lines because Singapore. Well, what's the actual value of Singapore, right? And my eye has to kind of go across and see. This is, uh, depending on what you want to show, you can leave the lines in or not. But I'll show you a solution to actually have the data if you need it. But for now, I'm going to remove the lines. And it makes it a lot cleaner. The next thing is the colors. The colors of each country have no meaning at all. They don't help me to see anything. They help me to, it shows that there's different ones, but the space in between the bars will show me that. The colors don't add any information whatsoever. So if I remove the colors of the country, now that simplifies the chart a bit, and I still have the data there. Now the next thing I remove is the 3D effects. <laughs> so in general, don't use 3D when you do graphs. It doesn't add any information to the graph. In fact, it makes it look, they, it kind of looks cool, right? Oh, I've got 3D, it looks great. But it doesn't add any information, no it doesn't. And it makes it a little bit more difficult actually to see the data. It can be a little distracting. These are small things individually, but when you add them up, it makes your data a little bit more difficult to see. So we remove the 3D effects. What else could we do? Well, the next one is sort. So they were in alphabetical order, but generally alphabetical order doesn't help you to see your data at all. It kind of makes it easier to find something, but what people really want to do is be able to compare. So I've sorted them. And the next thing I think that we could do is, again, gray out the ones you don't care about and put in red the ones that you really care about, the one you want to highlight. That's United States rate is higher than everybody else. Now, back to the lines, right? So let's say that you wanted to get more precise values. The values were important. Well, what you can do is you can put the numbers on top, right? So if that's important, and it may or may not be, sometimes all you care about is the values relative to each other. Sometimes you do care about each one of the individual values, so you can do that. So if you look at the chart before, so if we look at the one that we first started with, and then we look at the one after, at the end, I think, one, it's much easier to, to see the data, the information, much more easier to compare country versus country. It shows what your headline is and what's really important. Uh, and just much cleaner, it looks much more professional. So if you remove your chart jump from the charts that you have and make it as easy to, for your audience to see as possible, that will just add to your story and your data. Now one of the things you can do is you can go to a couple of different um, magazines. One is the Wall Street Journal and look at the New York Times and the economists, and look at some of their charts. And you'll see charts that look similar to this. And a lot of them, actually because it's a newspaper, will be single colors. And that's one of the things you can do also is say, if I had my chart and I had no colors, would it still be just as effective? Because um, up to 20, I think it's between 15 and 20 percent of men are colorblind. Mm -hmm. It's a lot lower in women, um, but a lot of people are colorblind. So, um, if you can use, if, you, if your chart looks good without colors, uh, that would be uh, all that more effective. The other thing is, as I mentioned, there are three things that you want your audience, your three goals in a presentation, and three things to ask yourself. What do you want your audience to know? So you're there to convey information and educate. What you want your audience to feel. So how do you get your audience to feel some emotion in your presentation? Do you want them to feel angry, upset, curious, anxious? Do you want them to feel that there's some injustice in the world or injustice in your um, in 
in whatever you're presenting. So you want them to feel some type of emotion. And the third is, what do you want your audience to do? So at the end of your presentation, don't forget a call to action. Say, you've heard this, this is what I want you to do. So what's my call to action? So it's a challenge to everyone here. In your next presentation, take one of these techniques and use it. Identify the story in your data. Think about how, what, what story does your tell. And think about how you can include a story in your data. Make it easy for the audience to see your story. And then also maximize the signal to noise ratio. Now one of the questions that I sometimes get is, if I'm doing a presentation, and let's say I'm an accountant, and I'm telling about the numbers for this quarter internally, what story do I have? They're just numbers. Right? It's, here's, you know, we've got this much revenue, we have this much profit, we have, you know, what story can I really tell about that? Well, here's one, here's a suggestion or an example on how to do that. Let's say you've got to go to your boss or a group of people to tell this, uh, to present your numbers. One way to get their attention is to say, today, or, or yesterday, I was working with our accountant group, and we were talking about the revenue for this quarter. And the person decided to, uh, the, our, our head accountant came to me and said, you know, our, our revenue, this number, is actually really interesting. So now maybe you got your audience's attention. What do you mean interesting? Well, what they did was, they said, I'm not going to tell you right away, but here's an envelope that I'm going to give you, and in five minutes I want you to open it. Now you've got your audience a little bit more curious. Well, what, what's going on here? Why, why all the drama and etc.? And then, so I waited the five minutes, I opened up the envelope, and then I looked at, here's the revenue number, and the revenue number was whatever it was, X, you know, $250 million, and it was $5 million above what I was expecting. So this is not a really exciting story, it's not really something that is earth shattering, but your audience will remember something if it's around the story more than just if you present the data on its own. So if you can take your uh, data, associate it with a story, people will remember it for much longer. So there was a study done, I've got just a few minutes, there was a study done at Stanford University. And at Stanford University in this study, what they did is they had students present and they had students present in two ways. The first group of students were presenting just raw data and statistics. The second group of students told a story. And they were about the same type of presenters, uh, but after the presentation, they got the people in the audience to rate the presenters, how effective they were. And the students rated people who told the story about 50% higher than people who just told statistics. And I guarantee again that when somebody tells you a story, you're going to remember the story much longer than you will any statistics that they tell. So if you can incorporate a story in with your data, you'll get your audience to pay attention longer you'll get your audience to trust you more and feel pleasure if it's a good story and remember what you tell them. Thank you so much for listening. Well, this way, um, we're going to give the just as a good hit on the club and it's to say thank you. So. This is an offer for me. If any of you have a presentation that you're giving and you want to help, there's an offer that I will help you with, a, with the presentation. It's only by cloud. So there's my email address. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So any questions? Actually, yes.
you know, it's very hard to invite him. You know, it took me four months. And I, I was in Western Digital, listened to his speech for almost two years. Today is only one, 10 ten percent, okay. <laughs> so we hope that you can come back to finish your ninety percent. <laughs> right, right. Well. So, any questions? Last chance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what well, we call for action? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can send people some tips on make people more excited and want to do something. Yeah. So, a call to action. You want the audience to take some action. So hopefully before then, you have got your audience excited about something, and uh, you've convinced them of something. Now you actually want them to, now you want to tell them, this is what I want you to do. So one of the things I think you have to keep in mind is, don't make the challenge or the ask, the call to action, too much. If you're, ask, if you're asking your audience to change some behavior, because if you ask if you ask them to do uh, something that's too big and too much immediately, uh, they might not do it. Right? It might be too difficult. So a lot of times to change, if you get somebody to make just a small change in behavior and make a small change in what they're doing, that can be enough to, to do it. Now, if you're in a corporate environment and you need to make a big change, then sometimes that's okay. Because if you convinced your audience. We need to change the way that we do, um, you know, our maybe our training in our company, or the way that we do accounting, or the way that uh, we do uh, our leadership. Right? Sometimes a challenge and a big change, if you've got an infrastructure around it, can be. It's okay to do a large challenge. But if you're talking to a group like this, who maybe you have no connection with and no authority over, all you have is influence. Asking them to make a small change, I think, is one of the best ways. So you put a while if you want them to uh, sign up or something. Mm -hmm. So you just be very direct. Like, hey, you said, like what? Yes, what so that you have. <laughs> so one, you want to make it easy to do whatever you're asking them to do. So if you want to ask them to sign up, one, you want them to do it immediately. So you don't want them to wait until tomorrow. If you can have forms sitting on their desk, say, can you please fill out the form right now if you're interested? So don't wait, right? Take a small action and take it immediately, and that's the most effective. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. This is not related to the topic, but I'm just curious about that picture. How do you make that picture? <laughs> <laughs> so I was at a trade show one time, and our company hired an a artist, and we drew people's faces for free. And then we, we gave them uh, to them in an electronic format. So that was mine. <laughs> Absolutely. So when you get, the question was, during your presentation, what if you get challenged? What if somebody has a negative point? So one of the things to do is, first of all, when you respond to Q&A, is that you're a professional. You don't get upset, you don't get worried, you don't criticize that well, person. Maybe you don't have the exactly answer sure. what you want. Yes. Yeah. At that time, so, mm -hmm. yeah, yes. So there's a couple of things to do. What if we don't have the answer right away? What I, uh, what I usually do in a presentation is one, I try to, be, I try to respond to everybody the same in Q&As, even if it's a stupid question. <laughs> um, so I'm professional, even if somebody's very critical. If I don't have the answer right away, I just tell the person I'm very honest and say, I'm sorry I don't have the answer right now, but I'll get it for you. Give me your contact information, and I'll, and I'll do that. Now, when you say that, make sure that you follow up, because your credibility is on the line. And if you're going to do some, if you say you're going to do something, make sure you, you actually do it. So it's, it's fine not to have the answers. In fact, people will respect you if you admit, hey, I don't have all the answers, but I will get it for you, and, and I'll provide that. So that's usually the answer. There was another question back here, yes. You mentioned the emotion is important. Yes. But you also mentioned that don't let you know the audience crush. Well, I said you don't have to. No, I, I said you don't have to. I mean, if your audience does, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But it's not necessary for the audience to have extreme emotions. It could be just curiosity. 
It could be your audience is maybe just maybe mildly upset because this is happening. Or maybe they feel bad because of, you know, you told them, you talked about your experience with your dying parents and how you wish you would have spent more time and maybe they start to feel a little bit guilty when they decide to call their mom up that night, right? Or something like that. Right? So you, it's, there's nothing wrong necessarily. Of course, in a business environment, you probably don't want to make you too <laughs> emotional. But in a situation like this, if you tell a very poignant story about yourself and your audience does feel that, there's nothing wrong with making your audience cry or having them respond to that in that way. Yeah. Yes? So is it possible the same data, you have the same data, but because your audience is different, you tell like Absolutely. Story. Yes, I actually, in this presentation, I had to cut out a lot. But in one of the examples I give, the same data can tell all sorts of different stories. It depends what you want to show to your audience. Yes, so that's, you have to determine what your audience needs, where they're at, what their knowledge level is, and then determine your headline from your audience. And a different audience, you might have the exact same data, but your information may be displayed in completely different ways. Okay, any other questions? If not, thank you so much for the Thank you very much.